Thank you, Ephraim, and uh, thank you for uh, mentioning my book. I was told by my publisher never to miss an opportunity to mention the book, which I see is also <laughs> on your shelf behind your left uh, shoulder. I'm very honored. So, uh, <laughs> so we, as you said, we'll switch now to, uh, to Europe. Uh, I think I'll start with the uh, title of my uh, presentation by saying that there is no European stance on the uh, Ukrainian uh, crisis. I mean, as always with the EU, uh, you have platitudes coming out of Brussels and uh, decisions uh, made essentially in Berlin uh, and Paris since London is no longer uh, on the list. Uh, but on the Ukrainian crisis, I think Berlin is mostly uh, absent and Paris is essentially wary. Uh, until a couple of uh, months ago, uh, Germany was run by the towering figure of Angela Merkel. Uh, she had the respect uh, of Vladimir Putin, although she despised him for his thuggishness and his lies. But Merkel's successor, Olaf Scholz, is not only uh, uncharismatic and bland, he has also been timid and passive on the uh, Ukrainian uh, crisis. Uh, as I'm talking, Scholz is uh, in Washington or is on his way to Washington uh, for what looks like a dress down. Uh, officials in Washington have been complaining that Scholz has switched to mute and uh, Germany's refusal to deliver weapons to Ukraine is causing frustration uh, not only in Kiev, but also among uh, NATO members. Now, under Merkel, by contrast, uh, Germany had been tough on Putin and it had acted swiftly. Uh, when Russia invaded and annexed uh, Crimea uh, in 2014, uh, Merkel had been proactive and she had convinced all EU members who were 28 at the time uh, to impose sanctions on Russia. Uh, together with France, Germany had established the uh, so-called Normandy format which included Russia and Ukraine. Uh, Europe was at the uh, negotiation table back then. Today, uh, Putin talks directly with Biden uh, over the heads of the uh, Europeans. Uh, this is, of course, part of Russia's old practice of uh, divide and rule when uh, dealing with NATO. Uh, but Putin could not have ignored Merkel the way he is ignoring Schultz. Now, for Putin, Schultz is a more convenient interlocutor than Merkel, not only because he lacks mm -hmm authority and gravitas, but also because he is a social democrat. Having grown up in East uh, Germany, Merkel had no sympathy uh, for Russia, to put it mildly. She was also strangely uh, an Atlantist, like the rest of her party, the CDU. Uh, Germany's social democrats, by contrast, have historically been more favorably inclined towards Russia. Ever since uh, Willy Brandt's Ostpolitik in the early 1970s, uh, German Social Democrats have sometimes been dubbed Russland Versteher, or those who understand Russia. Uh, one who seems to understand Russia quite well is uh, former German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder, a Social Democrat. Uh, he has been on Putin's payroll for years uh, for chairing the consortium that built Nord Stream 1 and 2. Uh, Schröder has uh, recently accused Ukraine of, uh, quote, saber rattling. In other words, he has been blaming Ukraine for the crisis. Now, it's true that Schröder is no longer chancellor and that Willy Brandt sounds like ancient history, but concerns about Germany's new government when it comes to Russia uh, are not unfounded. Uh, recently, the government fired uh, Vice Admiral Kai Achim Schönbach, the head of the German Navy, uh, for saying that the West should show Putin respect and recruit Russia as an ally against China. Now, although Schönbach was fired for his comments, he did express a sentiment shared by many decision makers in Germany. Uh, indeed, the uh, concept of Russland Versteher has been updated with that of Putin Versteher, those who understand Putin. Now, from, uh, from the uh, its refusal to supply weapons to Ukraine, its insistence on uh, building Nord Stream uh, 2, a project that increases European dependence on uh, Russia, on Russian natural gas, and which was opposed by the United States. Uh, Germany is seen as uh, not playing ball with the US and as undermining a united Western front against Putin. Now, of course, Nord Stream was built uh, under Merkel and therefore the uh, Social Democrats alone cannot be blamed for narrowing Europe's margin of maneuver vis-a-vis -vis Putin. 
And this model is narrow precisely because Europe depends on Russia's natural gas. The EU can impose tougher sanctions on Russia, but theoretically Putin can shut down the pipelines carrying Russian gas to the EU. Now, of course, the uh, consequences would be uh, unmanageable, especially in the winter, since EU, the EU imports about one third of its uh, natural gas from Russia. And that's an average because countries like, for countries like Austria and Finland, uh, it's 100%. Uh, but of course, turning off the gas tap would also be costly uh, for Gazprom. And tough Western sanctions would hurt the uh, Russian economy. But Russia would be able to hold on for quite a while thanks to uh, $30 billion of reserves sitting in, in its uh, central bank. And so far, by the way, Gazprom has made quite a lot of money thanks to the higher gas prices produced by the crisis. So it could be that maintaining the crisis without war is good enough for Putin. In any case, Germany poses a problem to the EU when it comes to natural gas because it consumes about a quarter of the EU's gas supplies and because it has become more reliant still on natural gas since its decision to shut nuclear plants following the Fukushima disaster. But Germany is not the only reason why Putin is unlikely to face a united European, European response. Uh, France is a part of the problem too. There is no French equivalent for the German expression Russland versteh, but there is definitely a French equivalent for the attitude. Indeed, uh, former French Prime Minister François Fillon was recently added to Putin's payroll by joining the board of Cibu, Russia's petrochemicals giant. And like their German counterparts, the French conservatives are not unanim unanimously Atlantist. Far from it. Uh, Fillon, who ran for president in 2017 as a Gaullist candidate, is a Russophile. Uh, Gaullist foreign policy was always about reducing French reliance on the United States. Hence did the de Gaulle pull France out of NATO's military command in 1966. Uh, during the 2003 Iraq crisis, France, French President Jacques Chirac, himself a Gaullist, had castigated the uh, governments of Eastern Europe, which were about to join the EU, for daring to show support for the United States, as France had built a united front against uh, the war in Iraq with Russia and uh, Germany. Now, Macron is not a Gaullist, although his foreign policy is by and large inspired by uh, the Gaullist tradition. He has hardly contributed to showing a united front vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Uh, two years ago, he called NATO brain dead and uh, called for dialogue with Russia. Uh, just like Chirac two decades ago, he's been floating the idea of the European army, something the Americans have always opposed, as an idea that risks undermining NATO. Now, Macron talks some, uh, somewhat confusingly about a strategic autonomy, a typical French way uh, of using coded language. But East European countries oppose the idea as much as the US does. And Macron's declarations and ideas on NATO have played into Putin's divide and rule tactics. Now, as I'm talking, Macron is in Moscow, on his way to Moscow, to discuss Ukraine with Putin. But make no mistake, the French initiative is about buying time and about adding photo ops to the presidential campaign. Uh, France's pre presidential elections are in two months, and Macron cannot afford to go against French public opinion. And when it comes to Russia, French public opinion split with strong Russian sympathies transcend right and left. The uh, presidential candidate for the center right, Valérie Pécresse, is a moderate conservative who talks in dollar points. But the other contenders with clear cut views, both from right and left, have more sympathies towards Russia than towards the US. Uh, this includes Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour on the right, and Jean Luc Mélenchon on the left. All three candidates, by the way, have committed to pull France out of NATO. So Putin, to conclude, Putin knows he can count on French public opinion and on French elections. But this will be over by late April. According to the uh, Economist uh, election model, Macron has a 79% chance of being re-elected. And if he is indeed, he'll get tougher on Russia, whether Putin invades Ukraine or not. Uh, at the beginning of his five-year term, uh, his term five years ago, Macron tried to impress Putin by inviting him to Versailles, establish personal relations, etc. Putin uh, has mostly ignored Macron. And besides being disappointed, Macron has also been angered by the deployment of Russian mercenaries 
from the so-called Wagner Group to Mali, where French troops are under pressure. Macron now calls Russia a destabilizing power, is attacking former Soviet republics with, by, with hybrid attacks, thus endangering Europe's security as well. Uh, Macron now warns of uh, quote-unquote serious consequences if Russia invades Ukraine. Uh, he no longer wants to be accused of being too soft or even complicit with Moscow or of dividing the EU or NATO. And besides the threat of economic sanctions, Macron has also deployed French troops to Romania to strengthen NATO's presence there. So my last point is that it looks like after Scholz's meeting with Biden and Macron's likely, likely re-election in April, uh, Paris and Berlin will get their acts together, uh, be tougher on uh, Putin, and be more in tune with Washington. And this should help deter Putin and reach a compromise on Ukraine's relation with both NATO and the EU. Now, the Europeans surely remember what happens when you let an autocrat get away with grabbing territories, hoping that the last bite will be the last one. And if Putin gets away with conquering Ukraine, of course, Xi Jinping will feel confident about taking control of Taiwan. I think it's not too late for Paris, Berlin, and London to show a united front. Uh, the UK is no longer a member of the EU, but it is a member of NATO. And it is uh, to be hoped uh, that if and when they do so, uh, it won't be too late uh, for Ukraine uh, and uh, for Europe. Thank you.